is Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 to 9. Once again, Isaiah chapter 42, <laughs> verses 1 to 9. That's found in Pew Bibles on page 1082. Page 1082 of your Pew Bibles, Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant whom I, I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is, what, uh, this is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth with all the springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I thought this would be a wonderful passage to meditate, not only as the Lord, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as also we're preparing our hearts and minds to, to celebrate the, the death and the resurrection of our Lord. In Isaiah 40, God had told the prophet to comfort his people. His people were living in exile. They were hopeless. They thought, my goodness, we have so sinned against God. There's no hope. We have so rebelled. He warned us so so often. And yet, here we are. We're doomed. And God says, no, there's always hope. There's always redemption. Because I am God. Because I am sovereign. Now, they're in exile, of course, not because they're good. It's not like, oh, why do good things happen to bad people? It's like, no, why do bad things happen to bad people? Well, they deserve it, and uh, they deserve the situation they're in, but God says, I'm, I'm sovereign. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to bring you out of this, and in this passage, we have what's called the servant song, one of the servant songs. There's actually four of them, um, and, and this is the first one, and it's so powerful because it talks about this individual who's going to come to redeem. Now, of course, it gets very complicated because if you read Isaiah through, one day, you know, if you have time, I mean, it's like something like 66 chapters. But if you ever have time, sit down and read Isaiah. And you'll see that servant is used both of Israel and of this mysterious individual. In the first half of chapter 40 to 48, it primarily refers to Israel, except for this passage. And then in chapter 49 to 55, it refers to this individual, except for one passage in Isaiah 54. And how can that be? Well, I think that modern scholars have gotten it correctly. I think people like John Oswald and and N.T. Wright hit it right on the nose. This is the ideal Israelite. See, Israel was supposed to do a job. Its job was to be the light of nations. It was supposed to be a holy people, living holy, and then spreading, spreading the good news of God's salvation, of God's law to the world. But they failed and failed miserably. Not only did they not reach the Gentiles, they themselves were unholy. They were constantly sinning, constantly going bad. If you don't believe me, just listen to Victor and his study on, on judges where it's like, you know, God sends a judge, they do good, okay, judge dies, they go back into their decadence. I mean, like, oh, oh, Gideon died yesterday. Okay, let's go sin. I said, wow, people, really that bad? And, and it's really, and it, over and over and over, and God said, I'm going to punish you. And uh, But then this one Israelite will come out of them, and he will be the one. He is the one chosen to deliver. He is the one that will bring justice, mispot in Hebrew, which is a very important word that you're going to hear over and over again. He's going to bring order out of disorder, out of the sin and chaos that has come into the world thanks to sin, or should we say, 
thanks to us, sin is not a thing that exists in and of itself. Sin exists when we sin. Otherwise, there'd be no sin. It's because of us that there's chaos in the world. Every time I look at the world, you know, I never, I never can look at things, you know, with rosy colored glasses anymore. When I was young, I could. I could be self-righteous, think, oh, look at all the evil people in the world, the heart. I know that I'm part of the problem. I know that I bring sin into this world. And so when I see evil in the world, I realize, I, you know, it's part of me. I'm, I'm to be blamed for this as well. It's not like I'm innocent. All of us are like that. And in this passage, we see that uh, we're told about how this Messiah relates to God. And then in verse 5 through 9, we see that God speaks directly to him. Uh, we see, first of all, the relationship that he has with the servant of God. His, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice, mispot, to the nations. Um, the one will deliver the many. So it's obviously not the nation of Israel. It's this individual who's going to deliver Israel. And not only deliver Israel, but deliver the nations. And this is the first signs, you know, well, actually you get all kinds of signs in Isaiah, that it's not a gospel simply for the Jews. It's a gospel for all people, for all nations. God wants to deliver everyone. And this language that is used here of Jesus, of the Messiah, is king language. You know, it's the language, of course, also used of Abraham and Moses because they were great, powerful men who were like, you know, had like their own small nations to, to guide. You know, Abraham, even though he was just a, a patriarch, we always think of him as like, oh, like a minor person. No, he he had a lot. He had a lot of property, a lot of things. He, he ruled over a lot of people. And, and so when people rule over others and they have that kind of power, they're supposed to bring justice to the world. When you see, you know, whether it's Biden or Putin or Ping or anybody else, they're supposed to bring justice to the world. With the power that is bestowed upon them, it is their responsibility to be just and not unjust, not to do evil, not to do crimes and try to cover them up, not to, tr not to try to silence those who are criticizing you, as we have seen lately. You know, it's to bring justice. And of course, that's difficult. That's difficult. It says that this one, this Messiah is going to bring justice to the whole world. Wow. If there's something that we need is justice. Someone who can judge righteously. Think about it. No matter who judges us today, even if I was your king or your lord or whatever, I could only judge you according to how good I am or how much wisdom I have or how just I can be. I would fail just like every other human leader. Because none of them are perfect. But this one is just. And this one will bring justice. These are the words, if you hear, if, when you heard these words, if they sound familiar, it's because these are the words that are found when Jesus is baptized. This is my chosen one, with whom I am well pleased. You know, you know, he will deliver nations. The Holy Spirit of God will fall upon him. And that's exactly what happens. The Spirit comes and anoints him as the one who's going to bring this justice. But this justice that he brings is radically different from the world. See, when the world talks about justice, let me, when, when Biden or Putin or anybody else, I don't wanna, I don't wanna pick, on, pick on Putin because he's just an obvious example these days. But Biden, I think he's just as bad um, in his own way. Uh, when they bring justice, really it's their own justice. And it means I'm gonna beat you over the head and make you do what I want you to do. It's coerced. It's like, you know, it's like in the ancient world, Rome. Rome was Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Yeah, bang, 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 bang. We'll crucify you if you disagree with us. That's what the nations bring. That's what the rulers bring. They bring one that is, that is harsh, that is brutal, but not this one. This one comes to bring salvation. He comes to rescue us. He doesn't come to lord over us. He comes to die for us. That's why this language is so radical, that he will that he'll be forsaken, that he'll be abandoned, that he'll suffer, that he'll die, you know, and yet he will not say a word in his defense. He brings forgiveness to us. Certainly, if there's anything that we need is to be forgiven. If we don't need someone else to beat us over the head again. We don't need one more, you know, we don't need a, you know, after Biden, whoever, Trump, whoever, to beat us over the head again. We don't need other rulers to keep trying to impose their will upon us. We need someone to deliver us. Amen. And this is exactly what he's come to do. And this language, if you see here, it, it just radicalizes everything. God, 
the way God rules, the way God does things is radically different from anything we ever seen and continue to see. Because unfortunately, sometimes you see even leaders today who are supposed to exemplify Jesus Christ and they're the worst of the worst. When you hear of pastors who are taking advantage of, of people in their congregation, stealing from their congregation, having affairs, doing all the horrible kinds of things, you know, all, I mean, every time I, I turn around, I'm like, really? Seriously, guys? You know, you're the guy supposed to be like being the model. And even our Lord told us, don't lord it over them, but be servant of all. He, I mean, you can't miss the words of Jesus, even if you miss the, even, even if you miss the words of Isaiah. Uh, you know, it's all there of what kind of people we should be and what kind of leaders should be we be when we are leading with people. You know, we're all supposed to have servant hearts. Whoever wants to be the greatest among you, be the servant of all. And yet we see so many leaders, even our churches, forget our government, even our churches, who are trying to rule. I remember I had a pastor who, uh, oh my goodness, always wanted his way. You know, bully pulpit, talk about bully pulpit. And he had a saying, he said, you know, my way or the highway. And I couldn't stop being me because if I stopped being me, then who would be me? I had to be me. So I changed it. And I said, my way or Yahweh's. Get it? Good. And that was my, and of course, he stopped using that phrase. You know, it's my way or Yahweh's. It should be God's way. It shouldn't be that you're on my side, but that you're on God's side, that you're listening to the Lord, that you're obeying him. If you're obeying him, you'll listen to me. If I'm obeying him, I'll listen to you. That's the way it works. That's how, how, how some mission works in the Lord. And yet, how radically different we see today. We need leaders who will be like Christ, who have, who have forgiveness. And look, and look what it goes on saying. He will not shout or cry out. Wow, I heard a lot of people shouting and crying out. Not, not little babies. Babies are okay. Babies can cry out. Or raise the, his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. Man, imagine that. See, the victors of the world, the leaders today, they conquer by crushing, by beating, by beating you to a pulp, by smashing you, destroying you. He has gentleness. He won't, a, a broken reed, he's not going to break a reed. He's going to mend it. He's going to heal it. If something is flickering out, you're dying out, your light is dying out, he's going to revive you. See, the language is so radical. This is not what we expect from a world leader. And certainly this is not even what they expected from the Messiah. They expected the Messiah to come and crush the Romans, annihilate them all together, destroy all Gentiles. <laughs> you know, then we will rule. And it's like, even they, with the book of Isaiah in front of them, couldn't see that the Messiah would not do this. That the Messiah will come in gentleness, meek and mild, turning the cheek, Helping, reaching out to those that nobody else is reaching out to, being with the homeless, being with the prostitutes, being with tax collectors, you know, being with people that were considered disdainful. The society wanted nothing to do with those are the people he hung out with. Uh, radically different, but it's all here already. It's already here telling us this. You know, I love the way John Oswald declares in his commentary he says, The point is plain. Like the child of chapter 9 and the branch of chapter 11. God answers to the oppressors of the world. Uh, God's answer to the oppressor of the world is not more oppression, nor is his answer arrogance, more, more arrogance, rather in quietness, humility, and simplicity. He will take all of the evil into himself and return only grace. That is power. Amen. You know, he takes on all the evil of the world. He doesn't come to crush, he doesn't come to kill, he doesn't come to be arrogant and rule over you. He comes to take your sins Amen. and put it on himself so that you can have the grace and peace of God. Amen. You can be forgiven because he's dying on a cross, crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the one who rules. Amen. That is power. It's easy to have power to crush, but power to heal I remember I always used to tell kids when I was a youth man, it was like, you know, you know, I used to point something like the pulpit and go, how many of you can smash and destroy this? And be like, Aah! of course, all the boys be like, you know, yeah, like, can we do it? Can we do it? That's not what they, I was not, <laughs> I was not uh, welcoming anyone to do that. I said, who can destroy it? Anybody can destroy it. Who can build one? Who can take the one that's been destroyed, demolished completely and build it right up? That's exactly what Christ comes to do. Amen. We have been beaten, 
by the rulers, by our leaders, by all these people always crushing us, putting weight on us, destroying us, and he comes to heal us. He comes to lift us up. It's, it's incredible. And again, all this in his time, all this perfectly, when we need it, his, faith, his faithfulness is that he will be there at the right time. When the right time came, he came to the world. When the right time came, he died on the cross. When we needed him, he came right at the moment. Right at the moment when we were in desperation, when we were ready to give up, when we said, forget it, I, I cannot take it, I'm going I'm to clock out of this world, I, I cannot deal with, this, with these things anymore. He came to us where we were. We didn't have to go to where he where it was. How many people get saved and they, they weren't even in the church? You know, God spoke to me in the weirdest way. I remember one of the weirdest testimonies I ever heard was, uh, uh, it was uh, I think it was Venezuela or something like that. There was uh, someone witnessing to a, a jailer. And the jailer was, I had, he had his Bible, he, you know, they gave him a Bible and he threw it out the window. And at that time, a person that was passing out who was contemplating suicide, you know, uh, he, was, uh, he was drunk, he wanted to kill himself. And he saw the Bible. He picked it up and he got saved. And I said, that's how God works. Amen. He goes to us where we are and speaks to us. But all this might give us the wrong impression of him. Because look at verse 4, it says, He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Don't confuse his kindness, his love, his mercy, his gentleness with weakness. He is the king. He is Lord. Like, you know, in the Chronicles of Narnia, when the children are going to meet Aslan, Aslan is the lion. Is, it, is, is, he, is he good? Well, of course he's good. He's the king, but he's a lion. <laughs> it's like, don't, don't pretend that he's not a lion. You know, of course he's good, but he's a lion. He's dangerous. Lions on, you know, I, I would never be stupid enough. I see all these people who do all these videos. They, they get in front of a lion. I was like, yeah. It reminds me of a book they used to, I don't know if they still publish a book called Darwin's Award. There's people who do stupid things and end up killing themselves. And I said, this is definitely a Darwin Award right there, or a nominee for a Darwin Award. Who puts themselves in front of a lion? A lion will devour you. And that's what he's trying to tell you. God is the lion. Christ is the lion of Judah. He is powerful. He could demolish you, but he's good. That's why he doesn't. But not because he can't. He will establish justice. Amen. Those who are evil will pay for their evil. He calls them to repent. He calls them to come him. He's doing everything possible for them to repent and come to him. But if they will not, he will judge them. If he didn't, then we would have to be worried because he would not be just. Justice, yes, he has his mercy reached out, but yes, he will judge as well. You know, in, uh, in the book of Malachi, after all things Israel has gone through, here's like 400 years before Jesus, Malachi says, where is the God of justice? Mispah. Where is the God of justice? And then how's the answer? The messenger will come and he will come to his place. The Lord will be in his temple and we will see him. Wow. Yes. The answer to that prayer comes through Christ and he will be the one who then gives us his Torah, who gives his instruction. Israel could not keep the Torah, could not keep the law. And therefore Christ came and fulfilled the law. As, as Paul says, Christ is the end of the law. The Hebrew people could not keep the law. The law was not given to us. It was given to Jewish people. The Jewish people could not keep the law. The Gentiles could not follow their conscience. They could not follow the light of nature. They still sin. All of us sin. But Jesus comes and he gives us his Torah, his instructions. The law of Christ is the way that he lived and the things that he taught us. And that's what we are left with now. We don't have to keep the law. We never had, to, we couldn't keep the law, even if we wanted to. Even all these people today who try to keep the law, I, I find this so humorous because they really don't keep the law. They, it's almost like, like, especially Cubans, I'm like, I love Cubans, you know, they're, they're trying to keep the law and then like all of a sudden, you know, it comes like, you know, the pork and they're like, yeah, yeah I gotta have that. <laughs> you know, let's make, make an exception to the law. There, you know, if we, nobody can keep the Hebrew law, nobody. But it wasn't even given to Gentiles, so Gentiles trying to keep it even sounds weirder. Jesus is the end of the law. See, Jesus came and he took the law upon himself. He kept it perfectly. The one Jew that kept the law perfectly was Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he nailed it to the cross. And through his blood, there's a new covenant. 
of grace and mercy and peace for the people of God. And that's what we're going to be celebrating today as we come to a Lord's table, that this is what he had to do to bring peace to us, to bring us, to reconcile us to God the Father. And this is what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago that soon we'll remember. And I wanted to bring it all together to begin to prepare our minds and hearts once again to remember what Christ has done. Because again, it, it gets to sometimes become so common. Oh, Jesus came, he died for my sins, oh, he, he rose from the grave. And then we forget, you know, wait a minute. We have to keep remembering this. Don't let it become so common. But never, I don't think we're ever going to get, make common the idea of a king who is kind and, and, and sweet and gentle and gracious. Because that's not real in our world. In our world, in our world is, the, is, the, is the opposite of that. And God now addresses himself to the Messiah. And he says, this is what the Lord, God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens who stretched them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it who gives breath to his people and life to those who walk in it. The creator now is the one who's addressing this. And he is the one who is powerful. It is him to whom all creation belongs. All creation belongs to God. All people belong to God. Don't let Satan fool you. I hate when people portray Satan like somehow there are two fighting for your souls. God and the devil are fighting for your soul. The devil's not fighting for your soul. He's fighting to keep himself alive. Because he's a creature, just like you and me. He was created, and he can be destroyed. He is not eternal. There is only one eternal being, and that is God Almighty. And Satan was just an angel who rebelled. You know, and sometimes I remember when I saw a picture years ago where Jesus being tempted, and you see a, a dark figure, of course, being Satan, and he's got these wings and it was so cool. The painting was so cool. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. He was an angel. Sometimes I forget that he was an angel. He's fallen. He's depraved. But he was just an angel. He's, not a, he's nothing greater than an angel. He's not God. God is the creator. And God is the one who has assigned Jesus to come and to redeem us. That's why Satan could not stop. If Satan could stop all this, he would stop all this. He doesn't have the power to do so. And God declares, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. Those two things are the same thing. A covenant and a light are together in, in the Hebrew. To open the eyes that are of the blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. This is the covenant that he has made with us to redeem us, to deliver us with his blood. And this, of course, is done through him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Torah was meant to give guidance. It was meant to give light. Jesus is our Torah. Jesus is the one who teaches us, who guides us, who gives us salvation, who delivers us. Everybody, Gentiles included, not just Jews, all people. But, of course, he does this through the cross, being wounded being bruised, being beaten, crucified. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy towards us in bringing salvation to us, not through the law, not through anything else, but in your own person, that you took on flesh and experienced the humiliation, the degradation, the evil of this world, took all that upon yourself to bring us salvation, to bring us redemption. Help us, Father, that our eyes will be open to see, to understand, and oh, to be transformed by your grace, that we might not only behold you, but become like you, for this is your desire. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
As always, of course, I want to give you the opportunity to prepare your hearts, although I think with the sermon, it was very, very much to prepare your hearts to remember that when we come to this table, what it means, and to never, I know that sometimes, you know, uh, as Baptists, um, we may tend to lower it because we just think, oh, it's just grape juice and bread. Yes, it is grape juice and bread, but it's what it symbolizes, what it represented, and what it means. And... 2,000 years ago, when they were drinking wine and eating bread, and people were taking it in an unworthy manner, doing all kinds of horrible things against each other, and singing against God, God judged them. And that testimony is in Scripture for us, which I'm, I, I definitely have to preach on that passage. That testimony is there to remind us not to do that. Don't do what they did. So as we come before the Lord, you know, lower your head, close your eyes, anything that stands between you and God, Confess it at this time. And if you feel uncertain about taking from this table, then don't take. Let us pray. Before we partake of the bread, I'd like to ask our brother Adrien to lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, uh, Lord Jesus, that you, you died on the cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your just never-ending mercy for us, for your patience for us, for your grace that you've shown us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we could be uh, an example of the mercy and the grace and the patience you have shown us, Lord, and that we could show that to other people, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for all that you've done. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And once he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Eat, for this is my body. Let us take and eat the body of Christ. Before we partake of the cup, I'd like to ask our brother Victor to lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, let us remember the night that Christ was betrayed. He reminded the Israelites, the disciples, that the Israelites were taken away from Egypt, from the slavery in Egypt. The same way Jesus is taking us from the slavery of uh, sin. When Jesus cried on the die on the cross, he absorbed all the sins of the world, dear Lord, and that broke his heart. Let us remember always the price that he paid for us. Yeah. Eternal vigilance is our job. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us, now and always. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 In the same manner, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that I make with you. The blood that is shed for the remission of the sins of many. Let us take and drink the blood of Christ.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen.